Hi everybody, and welcome to Astronomy on Tap. My name is Jacob, and we're going to be doing another Astronomy on Chat episode of our interview series today. Our guest today is Anna Hughes. Anna is a PhD candidate at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada, where she also received her master's in astronomy with a thesis on planet formation through pebble accretion. Before that, she earned her bachelor's degree in physics from the Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in New York. In her current research, she uses radio telescopes such as ALMA and the VLA to study the space weather around ultra-cool dwarf stars, which are the smallest, faintest, and coolest temperature types of stars in the universe. So Anna, thank you very much for joining Astronomy on Tap. Of course, happy to be here. So to get started, can you define for us exactly what is space weather? Sure. So space weather is the conditions in a certain region of space that are created by astrophysical objects. So typically when we talk about space weather, we're referring to the space weather created by the sun. So that can be okay. solar winds or so like energetic particles being blown off from the sun. It can be solar plasma. It can be magnetic field lines coming out from the sun. It's really just the set of conditions in space at a given position and it's usually time changing. So it's similar to weather on earth in that it changes, it comes and goes, it can be severe, it can be mild, just that, but in space and different processes, of course. So you said that the weather or the space weather coming from the sun, it infects, that could impact the earth. So this also happens around other types of stars as well? Absolutely, yes. So. Um, Pretty much all stars are giving off energy and magnetic activity in some capacity, and that's what's generating space weather. Now, mm -hmm. some stars have more space weather than other stars. For example, our closest neighbor, other than the sun, is Proxima Centauri b, or sorry, that's the planet, is Proxima Centauri, and Proxima Centauri is known for its extreme magnetic activity and flaring, and it's those flarings and, and activity are creating a much more dramatic space weather environment around Proxima Centauri than is around our sun. Okay. So why do you have to use uh, radio telescopes to study these ultra cool dwarf stars? Yeah, so ultra cool dwarfs, um, they're quite dim for one thing, which makes this a bit challenging, but I'm looking for a specific process called gyrosynchrotron radiation. And in order to see gyrosynchrotron radiation, we can only look to radio frequencies where it is the strongest. So that's within the one to a hundred gigahertz range typically, which is like a quintessential radio frequency range. And there is where I can see traces of space weather activity that I'm looking for. So what, what is gyrosynchrotron radiation? Can you give yeah, like a so really just like basic ex explanation of what that is? Absolutely. Gyrosynchrotron radiation is caused when particles, electrons, are accelerated along magnetic field lines to uh, mildly relativistic energies. And as they're spiraling around the field lines, they're also releasing energy in the form of radio light. So it's this energy that they release that I'm looking for. And this is the telltale sign of a space weather process that is causing the magnetic field lines to accelerate the particles. So I'm, I'm kind of looking for hints of a process that's happening that we cannot see directly. So then these are particles that come from the stars themselves? Like these electrons that, that uh, emit the gyrosynchrotron radiation, do they come from the stars? Yeah, they're, they're within the atmosphere of the star itself. Okay. Very interesting. So uh, right now, what is the project or the one ultra cool dwarf or group of ultra cool dwarfs that you are currently the most focused on researching? Right now, so before my baby was TRAPPIST-1 and TRAPPIST-1 was all over the news because it has this system of seven planets, four of which are potentially in the habitable zone where they could host life. Um, they would have the right temperature to have liquid water. I've done quite a bit with TRAPPIST-1 already though, so I've moved on and my new, uh, my new project is more looking at a sample of ultra cool dwarfs. So it's a sample of five, which isn't super, super exciting because when you hear about surveys, you usually think like thousands of stars. 
And part of why this is a challenge with radio telescopes is because these stars are so dim that we have to stare at them for a very long time in order to get a signal from them. So a five star survey is not too shabby. Um, and yeah, so I, I'm looking at this selection of five, four of them we know are radioactive, but we don't know the exact source. So I'm sort of trying to figure that out. And then one of them hasn't been observed with radio telescopes at all before, but it has some of the characteristics that make me think that it could be active at radio. So why these five stars? Did you just pick five at random or are these the five closest ones or are they particularly interesting for some other reason? Yeah, so, um, well, for one thing, they are quite close. And the reason for that is that we can't detect these kinds of stars if they're far away because they're so dim. But um, I selected them because some of them, as I mentioned, have already been detected at radio frequencies. So we know that they're radioactive. But at the frequency where they've been detected, it's unclear what the exact physical process producing the radio emission is. So I look at higher radio frequencies of these objects in order to try to disentangle what process is creating the radio emission. If it's something like gyrosynchrotron, like I mentioned okay. before. So yeah, you mentioned gyrosynchrotron. So there could be other possible sources of emission as well. Yes. Yeah, so the electron cyclotron maser instability, which is really a mouthful, is essentially a rural emission and it's caused by electrons gyrating in large scale magnetic fields. So are these different. auroras like that we have on planets? Yes, exactly. We see the same kind of thing in all of the magnetically or all of the planets in the solar system that have a magnetic field. And the difference between the two, um, that, that's like the, the striking difference, is that gyrosynchrotron radiation comes from magnetic events that are mm -hmm. causing space weather, whereas the electron cyclotron maser instability is much more mild. So gyrosynchrotron emission is indicative of processes that could threaten the stability of planetary atmospheres if there's a planet around the ultra cool dwarf, mm -hmm. whereas the electron cyclotron maser instability would not. Okay, very interesting. So you kind of um, touched on this one a little bit, but what are the current limitations, be they like technical or logistical or whatever, that are standing in the way of further advancing research into space weather around ultra cool dwarfs? Well, right now it's COVID-19, but... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, nominally, what were the limitations five months ago? Um, so, the biggest one is when we look at long wavelength light, like radio emission, mm -hmm. we have to use big telescopes to collect enough of the light to be able to observe them. There's this relationship between what's resolvable and what the wavelength is. So longer wavelength light, we need a bigger diameter telescope to collect it. And we can get around this a little bit by using interferometers, which is like pairings of dishes that will collect the radio light and we can add the light together from the two um, the two antenna but the the biggest um, technological difficulty is just physically building a radio telescope that's big enough in order to collect enough of the light and get a really good resolution okay so you're saying if there was bigger telescopes then your job would be easier absolutely okay so yeah, just, and so why um, don't you just build bigger telescopes? Well, so NASA <laughs> just um, the other week, I think, approved funding for a proposal to build a telescope on the dark side of the moon or yeah. um, the far side of the moon, more accurately. Yeah, they um, uh, they approved funding to look into a feasibility study to yes. build one in a crater on the far side of the moon. Yes, and that would be fantastic. Awesome. Yeah, that would be that would be really interesting. Um, so now moving on to something that isn't uh, necessarily research specific. So what does your average day, so before the ongoing <laughs> pandemic, of course, typically entail? Like an average day for you researching space weather, what, would, what do you do? Okay. Um, so in my work as a grad student, I'm also working as a TA. So a lot of my day would also be taken up by teaching students or marking their assignments. Um, so that's a, a big component of my life. But in my research, um, I would be 
downloading data from a telescope. So the two telescopes that I use, ALMA in Chile and the VLA in New Mexico, are operated full time by a staff that's there. They don't have me physically go and take the data because this is just too complicated of a system to be doing this with all of these different astronomers since they have a full time staff. So what, I'll, what they'll do is essentially take the observations and then make them available to me, the PI, or the person who put in the proposal to observe the objects. They send it to me and then I download the data, I analyze the data on my computer, and then I try to figure out what exactly the observations that I'm dealing with mean for the physical models of ultra-cool dwarfs. Okay, wow, so that sounds pretty complicated. It sure is, buddy. <laughs> so um, looking into like the very distant future, let's say 50 to 100 years from now, what do you think the astronomy landscape in, re in regards to research areas and then available facilities will look like? Do you think we'll all have like telescopes on the far side of the moon or what do you think it's gonna look like then? In 100 years, I suspect that we will. On the far side of the moon, I suspect we'll have at least one radio telescope. Hopefully in 100 years, JWST, the James Webb Space Telescope, will have been launched, but we'll see. <laughs> it's been delayed and delayed and delayed. Um, and the James Webb Space Telescope is kind of like the answer to both Hubble and the Kepler Space Telescope. It's this very, very powerful telescope that we'll be launching in. I'm not sure when the launch is planned for them, because they keep delaying it, but in a few years probably. So that'll, oh. that'll play a huge role. And um, within a hundred years, I'm sure we'll have another telescope that's um, space-based and that has high resolution as a follow-up to JWST. So, so what about research areas? Do you think that people will still be actively studying space weather or do you think we'll have figured it all out by then? Or what do you think? <laughs> uh, I'm sure that we'll be working out the details. We'll probably have a better understanding of ultra cool dwarfs as we develop more sensitive telescopes and mm -hmm. we're like better able to, to study them at radio wavelengths. Um, I'm imagining, and this is very speculative, but I'm imagining that with JWST, maybe we'll start to be able to detect biosignatures on planets around stars. And biosignatures are just um, essentially emission that is associated with biological processes. So we would be able to see that this planet has a spectrum that looks a little bit like it might be produced by life if the life is similar to what we have on Earth. So we might get to a point where we're able to pinpoint specific planets where we think that life may be present. Wow, that sounds uh, very exciting. Yes, yes, it's a, it's a field of astrophysics called astrobiology, and I think that in 50 to 100 years, astrobiology will just be huge. Awesome. Well, cool. Well, uh, thank you very much for uh, sitting down and chatting us with, with us today. Um, I, I know you probably have a, uh, a very busy day of uh, social distancing and self-isolating. Yeah. So. <laughs> a packed day of washing my hands and writing my thesis ahead of me. Well, good luck with that. And again, thank you very much. And uh, hopefully we can have you back on again sometime soon. Always happy to be here. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everybody, for joining us this week. Be sure to put comments below to give us feedback to let us know uh, what you think about these types of interviews, if there's anything you'd like to see in the future. And be sure to uh, check back because we're trying to post a new video at least once a week on Thursday evenings. See you next week.